Hey everybody, just having my little morning walk in the garden and uh, I was chatting with somebody and I happened to mention I have ADHD diagnosed by a doctor which is a categorization for a certain, I suppose, what society would call the mental illness. Ajahn Spencer, so people call me Ajahn and ask me for advice from a person who officially has mental illness. Hmm, that's strange indeed, no? According to society. But then again, uh, Einstein had ADHD, which I have too. You know, Albert Einstein, E equals MC squared. Um, and so he was obviously mentally ill according to society too. The truth about Einstein is that, um, I'm going to walk away from the pump, it's making a noise. The truth about Einstein was that uh, he couldn't even remember his own telephone number or address, ever. Yeah, so he'd have to ask his, his wife before he separated with her and uh, so on. Or write it down on the back of his, on the palm of his hand, I suppose. I just, um, I used to have, have my phone these days, I now know my iPhone, if I click on the phone and the contacts, the top contact will have my own number, so I can find it quickly when people ask me my number, because also if it's 085432, I will say 084235, I have dyslexia of numbers as well. That's why I had a terrible time in maths at school, because the way the, the, they tried to teach it, couldn't understand it. I met a math, math teacher in my last year of school. After two years of not going to school, I went back for the O-levels, which of course I didn't even sign. I just went in to each examination, signed my name and left the forms empty. So I got like zero, 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 zero in everything. Completely unqualified person. To have a single qualification according to society, me. But I can read, speak and write six languages, at least six languages, or more, I don't know. But the ones I can flip in my head and speak, flip from one language to the other is about six. And I can write, read and write about six, seven, eight, if, well, most code languages. I mean, once you can write C++ or Python or something and HTML, so you can look at PHP, MySQL database language, and, I can do all of those. I'm self-taught. I'm an autodidact. And I've studied uh, the rise of civilization and the history of the world uh, and the history of humanity on, in a paleontological way, meaning uh, looking at digging up bones and looking at how we evolved by each stage that we've managed to dig up and find in archaeology. Yeah, so archaeology, paleontological archaeology. So an archaeologist who looks for bones because he wants to study the uh, carbon dating and try and find DNA to find the origins of mankind and uh, how, how, huma how we became human, becoming human. And then once we became human, how... Um, the rise of how, what makes us different from the animals? You know, like finding clues of the first necklace making or drilling a hole through shells. They found a cave in an area where Neanderthals had also been drilling, making necklaces, which they got from the Cro-Magnons. Because after the Ice Age, before the Neanderthals died out, Cro-Magnon, which is, we are mostly Cro-Magnon, I mean, the human, the Homo sapiens, there were various kinds of Homo sapiens scattered around the earth. And in Europe, after the Ice Age, there were mainly Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons. And when the Cro-Magnons came on the scene, uh, the Neanderthals, according to history ten years ago, we wiped out the Neanderthals as if we went to war with them or something. Now we actually know that actually we interacted with them. We were uh, the, the Cro-Magnons, I say we, we are actually Cro-Magnon mixed with Neanderthal. Believe it or not, you are part Neanderthal. So when you look at a Neanderthal, don't think bad of him because he's one of your ancestors' mates. Yeah? Because the Neanderthal interacted and some of them actually had it off together and had children. 
So uh, we have Neanderthal uh, chromosomes evident in our DNA. And then uh, looking at civilization, you know, I'm talking about I have no qualifications, you know. Some people have a PhD and they call me Ajarn and they take or ask me for advice or a teaching about something or an insight. They have no qualifications. They have dev teams of various, uh, what I would say, uh, digital services. They have products of their product who constantly take my insights and advice about the internet and their products. So I'm also, it's free, I don't charge them, but they're, they're very glad to get it. Uh, so I'm actually very capable uh, internet, uh, internet of things consultant. And I have not a single qualification, and I have ADHD like Einstein which is what the title of this Facebook Live was, about ADHD. You may notice that I've gone from ADHD through the history of civilization into paleontology, not yet mentioned anthropology, and that I'm, I'm like a roulette uh, wheel. Each different channel of numbers on the roulette wheel is one part of a bigger story, of a big picture, right? And when the ball falls into the middle, that's when I've told you 25 seemingly unrelated stories. You think he was talking about ADHD, now he's going on about the history of civilization. What the duck is he talking about? Uh, what the Donald Duck is he talking about? Well, what I'm doing is I'm circling around the point, the heart of the matter, which if you can't see it yet, you don't have ADHD. And what I'm doing is I am raising all the, ne all the relevant topics and related matters so that when I've gone around the roulette wheel and told every story and every relevant, relevant related matter, when I finally explain the point at the end, which is when the ball falls into the middle of the roulette wheel, that's when the person will understand. But if you have ADHD and you're explaining things like this, you know somebody like uh, an assistant at a counter who wants to know what the customer is getting at and what actually do you want, or a lawyer or... Um, any government officer who has to give a service uh, and you go up to the counter. If, when I start talking, like I'm talking now, the person sat at the table doesn't know what I want yet. And he's not going to be patient enough to wait until I'm finished. If they wait until I'm finished, they will not only know what I want, they will have a complete comprehensive understanding of that and much more. And they'll probably have learned 10 things that have never thought about. But having ADHD is very difficult because you can't give a short answer to somebody. There is no such thing as a short answer from me. I know how people are, can cleverly, uh, concisely sum th something up. And it's necessary sometimes. And for somebody who understands and can think for themselves to just sum something up in a short statement or a proverb, that's what proverbs are actually. A proverb encapsulates something that you have to spend years contemplating and thinking about to understand the truth of it. And if you understand it, when you hear the one-line proverb, it has such great deep meaning to you. Hmm? No? But um, I don't like giving one-line proverbs because I know they're only worth something to somebody who has already understood a thought for himself or herself. And so somebody with ADHD, they have to explain something in great, great detail. Hmm? You see, this video is about ADHD. Is it an illness? Yeah, or is it just... We can't, you see, I can't even remember what the second part. Is it an illness or is it just being different? That's not what I call the title of this video, but anyway. I didn't say being different, I said something else, or just a condition, a different condition, a different state of, uh, of mind. Now, for ADHD, 
You know, is it an illness? Well, Albert Einstein is uh, considered to be what... I mean, they've got his brain in a jar. Uh, they've studied his brain. Uh, believe me, they've concluded things about what he had in his thalamus and hypothalamus and the left and right side. And if he used it, the left side more than the right side and so on. And that uh, he had a piece of his brain which was more developed. And, you know, I, might w I want to have my brain looked at afterwards. I'm dead because I have ADHD. So I think I'll probably donate it to some ADHD lab. I'm, I'm researching who I would donate it to. My brain. Looks funny, doesn't it, a brain? It's all wiggly. <laughs> so, ADHD, you don't really have... Um, if you say to me, to, uh, what time shall we book a taxi tomorrow? I will actually get an inner physical feeling of tenseness and panic. The tenseness and breathing in my body, which comes from the chemicals released by my brain, from being forced to have to think ahead to the future, makes me have an illusion sensation, which humans called, call emotion. So I, actually, I'm just thinking, my brain has ADHD, and it only thinks in the present. It doesn't have a beginning, a middle, and an end. A past, a present, and a future. There is no past or future. There's only, I can only think of what I'm doing right now in the moment. And if you try to force me to think ahead, plan ahead to something, I mean, how can I tell you what time to book a taxi tomorrow when I don't know when I'm going to wake up? It's ridiculous to me in my world, in my universe. How can I tell you because I don't know when I'm going to feel like going right now? Uh, tomorrow, because now is now, it's not tomorrow yet. And tomorrow when I wake up, I, when I feel like going, I will call a taxi. I'll say, can you come and pick me up? Or if I have to go on holiday and pack my bags, I'm not going to think, oh, next week I'm going to Spain, I better start looking for what things I'm going to take, and I can't do that. I will get in a really bad mood from the, you see, it's not now, it's then. I can't deal with, it doesn't exist yet. And the Buddha also taught, explained, that the reason we are not experiencing reality, we are not awake, or the reason most of us are not awake, but to change that, to be more accurate, the reason most people, well, that's like 99.9% .9 of the world, are not awake is because of this. Because they are lost in thinking of what just happened and what I've got to do tomorrow. Or I have to remember that I have to do my 90-day reporting to the immigration next week. Or I have to look at my passport to check when I have to do 90-day reporting, which I have to do. And with ADHD, having to remember or think of doing that creates intense, well, if you want to call it emotion, vetana in Pali, tukha vetana, dukha vetana, uh, uh, afflictive emotions, suffering, huh? stress. The thing is, I don't believe in emotions. I think emotions are just a name for something abstract. It's a feeling. I should really just say feelings, sensations, awareness of sensations. When you become aware of being sad or angry or stressed up, you think it's like something spiritual inside a spiritual thing called your heart, right? You see, I just went, that was an outer expression. Actually, I'm out of breath from walking, but it could have been an outer expression of relief or of uh, sadness depending on the inflection, it's very subtle. <sighs> that's a I give up kind of one, wasn't it? Or a, <sighs> that's a sigh of relief, a sigh, yeah? There's a sigh. It's already gone. You see, I did a sigh, it's not here anymore. That's proof of impermanence.
So, because most people are not enlightened. Why? Because this future that doesn't exist, their mind is there, or this past, which is gone, their mind is there, and flicking between there and there and there. Huh? And uh, you know that charlatan, Eckhart Tolle, who is a complete charlatan and has a billion dollar guru business, marketing business grown up around him, who says uh, the solution to anger is to punch a cushion. False gurus. And don't ever call me a guru, anybody. You know, some people email me and say, Master, I would like to come and bow to you sometimes. I say, what the fuck you want to bow to me for? I've lived a shit life. I'm just human. What do you want to bow to my smelly feet for? I'm just the same as you. I'm somebody trying to perfect himself, not doing very well. I happen to have the ability to explain things and those who have wisdom to take the explanation and use it for their own betterment and their own lessering of suffering, good for them. They'll probably go further than me, faster than me, which I'd be pleased with. Most people, uh, if an unenlightened thought would be to be pissed off because they've gone further than I did after I taught them. And I'm, I, got, I found it first and I taught somebody else and they got there before me. Well, that means that you taught them well, doesn't it? Hats off to you for teaching somebody so well that they got there before the teacher himself. You know? I don't just teach. Don't think I've mastered the things I teach. All of the things I teach. I may have mastered some of them. Who knows? It's not important. What's important is for you to master that yourself. Master your own heart. What's the hardest thing in the world to conquer? Your own heart. You can conquer an empire, you can conquer a country. Alexander the Great did it, Genghis Khan did it, huh? Attila the Hun did it, so, um, Rome, Caesar and all of, the, all of the Caesars did it, the Roman Empire, the Egyptian Empire, the, the, the Xerxes and the Persian Empire. That's easy if you've got enough lackeys behind you. But to conquer your own heart, you don't have any lackeys to help you. All you've got is yourself. <coughs> And if we con ourselves, you know, if we say, now look what you've gone and made me do. You know, like, uh, you're just preparing a milkshake and somebody call, uh, comes in the kitchen and says, hey, what time is it? And you look up at the clock and as you turn to look up at the clock, your hand hits the side of the fridge and smashes the glass. The milkshake pours out onto the floor which was the last milk in the fridge and you were really looking forward to drinking that and you cut your hand on the glass. And you turn around in anger at what has happened and instead of focusing on your anger and extinguishing it because it's suffering, anger is fire, fire is hell. Where is the hell? In the heart of the person you're hating or inside yourself? Inside yourself. The person you're hating doesn't even know about the fire in your heart when you're thinking about him. And you turn round and you accuse the person next to you who asked you what time it was. Now look what you've gone and made me do. You've made me break my milkshake and cut my hand. When you should be saying, actually, I should have been paying more attention and I should have turned round more carefully knowing that I'm doing something as somebody's asking me to do something and I should put down the milkshake, turn round and look at the clock and answer them and be more careful. It's not their fault, his or her fault, it's my fault. But actually there's no such thing as fault. It was just an unskillful act. It's gone, I've done it, made it, made the mistake, I've cut my hand, fix it, carry on practicing, leave it behind you. Don't dwell on it. Because if you dwell on it, you're in the past, not in the present. Hmm? Hmm? Don't dwell on the anger or don't dwell on the regret for what you said when you were angry. Don't dwell on anything, because if you dwell on things, you're not in the now, the here and now. You know, N-O-W-H-E-R-E, N-O-W-H-E-R-E. Here, now, here, now, here, now, where, nowhere, 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 now, here, now, here, now, here. 
Now here, now here, now here, now here, now here, now here, no where, no where, no where, now here, now here, no where. Here and now is nowhere. You write now here in a circle twice and then start chanting it 108 times and see how many times your brain hears now here and how many times your brain hears nowhere. You imagine the letters in your mind visually. You read it around. You don't have to chant the mantra. Just read the mantra in a circle. Now here, now here, nowhere, nowhere, nowhere. Hmm? Everybody knows here is nowhere. Hmm? Here we are, nowhere. And everywhere is nowhere, so nowhere is everywhere. Huh? Am I crazy? <laughs> Somebody says that. Yeah, somebody who does not understand will say, that guy's crazy. Everywhere is nowhere, so nowhere is everywhere. And that's why there's no future, no past to exist in. There might be a future on the Akashic plane, but you can travel through if you can get out your body. There might not, I don't know. Just talking. There might be a past stretched out to beginningless time across the Akashic plane, which you can visit if you could get out of your body. But right now, your mind, your consciousness, can only exist in one place. Not in the past, not in the future, but in the here and the now. And so in ADHD, really it's not an illness. What you have is lots of people who don't fit in with society and no two people are different. It's like amulets, Prat Somdet Vadrakang, the famous Somdet amulet. I've got over a hundred authentic ones. No two look the same. They were hand pressed. There are no, no two ears look the same. No two fingerprints look the same. Hmm? They do not look the same. No two things are the same. Hmm? And so if you get 45 people who are not the same, but are kind of like me, but they are them, I am me, but I don't fit in with society. I go out of my house about once a month if I have to, or twice a month, if I have to. Yesterday I had to Western Union. So I went out to the bank, and just having to try to communicate and get a Western Union transfer made was enough for me, you know, uh, whilst my girlfriend went for 20 minutes to the market, I just, I did some walking meditation up and down and then I squatted down, as you see we do in Thailand, like this, like this, yeah, and just sat there, right, put my hands together and the breath, be mindful of the breath, you hear the cars passing by whilst being mindful of the breath. There's all this hustle bustle around me. The market's over there, it's really busy, you know. There's cars everywhere, people coming home from the school and work and people going to the shopping and picking up their dinner on the way home. And I don't know about that. To me, there's just... And after a while of... But being mindful of the breath, you are also mindful of this. It becomes a white noise. It becomes a white noise. Which you, if you were stood with your eyes open looking at it, you'd see cars coming and going. That girl's beautiful. Uh, shit, my skin's crawling from the way that guy's looking at me. Oh, we must have been enemies in a past life or something. He's making me feel, you know, when you feel like you're going to be in a fight with somebody or something. All of these things battering me in the world. So that's ADHD because society has forced everybody to be lost running around in where they're coming from and where they're going to and they forget where they are right now living in the present moment. Be aware of the breath. You see? Mm? Whilst I'm talking about these people don't know this and that and the other, am I aware of my breath? Because if I'm aware of my breath whilst I'm talking about this I will know if my breath is heavy. I know right now my breath is getting shorter because I'm walking and I'm talking. Yeah? And that 
plus something I just thought about caused my brain, my thalamus to hypothalamus to cortex releases uh, enzymes which will well I'll show you some. Do you wanna do you wanna notice it yourself? What bugs you the most in life? Who bugs you? Or who is your greatest enemy who is hurting you right now? Or what stresses you up more than anything? Think about it. Focus on it now, but be aware of the breath while you do so, if not dangerous. Sorry. Uh, sustain your mindfulness of the breath. I am breathing in, I am breathing out. Know this, no I am breathing in, no I am breathing out. You have to say it in words with your head, for God's sake, don't do that. As you breathe in, be aware and mindful that you're breathing in and what the sensation feels like. And when you're breathing out, do the same. And also know if it is long, if it is short. Don't put, change it, don't try to control it or force it. Just know, just know. Leave it alone and just leave it what, do what it wants to do. Now, when I first heard about meditation, you know, the first thing I thought when they told me about Anabhanasati, which is the first of the four Satipatthanas, which the Buddha taught as a path to enlightenment, yeah, is mindfulness of breath. I thought, how is looking at the breath on the tip of my nose going to enlighten me? I should hold it like this because I've got hairs coming out of my nose. I don't care if I'm ugly or not. That's another thing. Uh, looking at yourself in the mirror, and, mm -hmm, uh -huh, uh -huh. but I'll talk about that another day. <sighs> it's just heavy baggage to carry, sorry. But you see, I had an emotion, you saw my face go like, uh. yeah, this emotion, from my digression, ADHD, this emo I'm going around the roulette wheel. If you've been from the beginning, you know what I mean with the roulette wheel. Um, emotion. Everything, human concepts are all imaginary, abstract ideas, as is the abstract concept of emotions. I think I'm having an emotion. I'm happy. I am happy. Uh, Buddha taught there is no self, right? So I am happy. So who's having the emotion? I don't even go there. Who's there? I got rid of that a different way that nobody's there, but something is there, but it's not an unchanging person. The not-self thing of Buddhism that most people can't get their heads around. Yeah. So I'm digressing into non-self now, and that is not what I wanted to, to go into. Yeah. I wanted to go into the breath and why something as seemingly unimportant as the breath um, can lead you to enlightenment. And what is enlightenment? Most people think it means you're like Superman or you can hover or something. I'm sorry, enlightenment means you're completely pure of any kind of impure intention, wrong intention. You're purified. You, you don't even think of stealing. You don't have to keep a rule that you promise never to steal or speak bad about others or kill or kill animals or whatever like the inclination has gone completely because you've cut the root you are pure it's nothing to do with psychic powers and you know the only reason that people think it's to do with people floating on magic carpets being enlightened are because the people who aren't enlightened have an ego they want to be like that i want to be a buddha don't want to be anything because wanting to become something it's not going to get you, get you to be a Buddha. The only way to become a Buddha, and you can't become a Buddha because you already are one. And while I'm on saying be, be or become, here is another ADHD thing, that I only see the process of becoming. Yeah? What I was yesterday is not what I am today, and what I am now, how I feel now, what I think and what I know, won't be the same 24 hours from now. And that's very hard for me to say, because for ADHD, I don't need to think about 24 hours from now, because what matters is how I am now, and being aware and awake to it, right? So, 
Why do we look at such an insignificantly seeming thing like the breath? Here we go. Your heartbeat, your blood flow, uh, what all the, back, uh, the blood corpuscles do, your liver and your kidneys and your digestive system is completely automated by the subconscious mind. As is your breathing. Because unless you're practicing mindfulness of breathing, meditation, and you know you're breathing whilst you're walking and talking live on Facebook, and you're aware of your breath, hmm, then you're awake. If you're aware of your breath while you're speaking, cooking, walking, sitting, shitting, showering, even maybe, well, no, I won't go there. <laughs> yeah. If you are aware of your breath, because the breath is the only subconscious process, if you don't think of the breath, you breathe automatically whether you are awake to the fact or not, aware of the fact, or conscious of the fact or not. Yeah? Most people breathe all day and they've never realized once that they're breathing. They haven't thought about it. So, it's an unconscious, subconscious mind process. It's an automated process. But it's, so is the liver and the heart. But you can't watch your, you can maybe watch your heartbeat, but that's very difficult. But you can't watch your digestive system or your liver or your kidneys. And so the only or easiest of all subconscious processes to watch, to be able to consciously monitor, is the breath. Therefore, that is the access point. That is what I and the Vikings and many people call the Rainbow Bridge. Yeah, to Asgard, yeah. What it is, is it bridges the conscious and the subconscious mind. Yeah, it's the access point, what would you call the portal, the access portal to the subconscious mind. And so when you become aware of the breath, apart from mindfulness of breath, simultaneously sustained whilst cooking, eating, talking, that's a difficult one, yeah. Most people will tell you to chant Buddha or Putto in your head, like put to and notice after five breaths that you've forgotten and you've got lost in the conversation about the sandwich. Then feel frustrated and hopefully know that feeling frustrated is also not meditation and drop that and get straight back to mindfulness of breath again. Because noticing you've wandered is the first proliferation of thought, but then there's a second which goes, oh, first of all, I've wandered. That's the first thought. I forgot to be aware of my breath. As soon as that happens, the mind causes a second thought of, well, actually, it's not a thought. It is a thought, but we think it's a feeling. As soon as you've noticed, oh, I forgot to be aware of my breath whilst I was chopping this cucumber because somebody spoke to me. Damn! That, damn, I will, I've drifted off, is the second proliferation of thought. There's a butterfly. Hi, Mom, hi. I always say hi, Mom, when I see a butterfly, because she said, if you ever say, see a butterfly, it's me. And my mom died over a year ago, so, well. She changed her state over a year ago, as we all shall, because you're going to die too, and me pretty soon, very soon too. Sooner than you think, everybody, all of us. So um, once you have my sustained focus of mindfulness of breath, you start to enter the present moment. We get back to ADHD in a minute. This is more important. Um, apart from it giving you access to the unconscious process of the breath, once you've done that and you use the breath as an anchor, at first, the brain, and for a very long time, the brain organ 
is programmed by evolution. And do you remember I said I was studying evolution, paleontological, anthropological evolution, DNA, the rise of human civilization, how we became human? Yeah, it's because I wanted to learn the science of the matter. I consider the Buddha a scientist. He explained the five aggregates which you have to know about because when you're meditating these five aggregates or khandas or khan or skandhas if you're in India yeah five components that make up a conscious living human being five main components uh, form uh, feelings perception slash memory I'll, I'll explain why perception and memory are the same thing another day um, Sanya, Sankhan, uh, con all conditioned thoughts and conditioned things within the body. And Vinyan, uh, awareness, consciousness. We all possess these five things. And when you're meditating, you have to examine those. Yeah? Now, the brain has evolved to protect itself and to take advantage, to exploit the situation around it for survival of the species. So if you see in the modern age, it's not like, hey, look, there's uh, uh, loads of fruit trees and no other monkeys. I'm going to climb up and live in this tree and this is my nest because there's lots of fruits around here. Which is, of course, a selfish thought, is thinking of oneself. And nature programmed us to do that so that the bodies of each different species survive. It's programmed into your DNA. And now, because we're not picking up fruits as hunter-gatherers, we're living in a concrete jungle, you, instead of seeing a fruit, you might see somebody's dropped their Nokia telephone or their, their iPhone 10 on the floor. Nobody's seen it, and it's just there on its own. You see? Look at your mind. Look at your mind. When you imagined that, what did you think? Did you think, I could take it? Did you think, I should leave that because the owner might be in the shop inside there and realize, and if I leave it, he'll be able to come out and come back and find it. Or where you think, uh, I don't want to get involved with that because uh, I don't know if it has an owner. I don't know if the owner is going to come back and look for it. And if I take it to the police station, maybe the owner will come back in a minute, half a minute, running down the road and look for it and it's gone because I've taken it. Or, I don't want any karma, I think I'll just leave it and walk past. Or would you take it? Or would your heart say, wow, free Nokia, free, uh, free iPhone. That costs a thousand dollars, man, shit. Or I could sell that. Well, your heart's not pure, you're dirty. If, if that's what you thought, then you will know I have not attained stream entry yet. I have not attained the first entry point to purity, to enlightenment, to Buddhahood. If when a mosquito or a fly goes past you and you go like that with your hand to move it out of the way, if it's like, come on, I'm gonna kill you now. You look at your heart when you do it, or do you just go, I don't want to hurt, if it does your heart feel I don't want to hurt you, but also I'm scared of dengue fever, I've had it three times. So I'm just pushing out of the way and I'm going to go into the house now because I don't want to get bit in case you're a dengue mosquito. And I don't want to kill you either. Or the cockroach, do you sweep him into the thing and then put him out of the house somewhere where he can go live in the grass? Or do you stamp on him with hate in your heart? Yeah. Or you have infested and you have to kill some and you have to lay poison down. Do you have regret in your heart? Or are you... I'm going to kill you all, you bastards. I can't even make a sandwich without you ants coming around and bothering me. Actually, they're just mothers and fathers trying to look after their children like you, going out looking for food, you know? So um, look at your hearts. When you're breathing, your brain will be working. Genesis, genetics, evolution, Mother Nature has programmed the brain to think I could take that Nokia telephone, yeah? But you don't have to take it. That's not you, that's your brain. Your brain is programmed to look at all possibilities and all situations you can exploit. Now, the Buddhist precepts, the minimum five, forbid you to exploit certain things. 
So you don't do it if you take those precepts. But does your heart want to? Because if you don't drink, but you want to, you haven't beaten it. You're just, it's like pulling a belt tight around yourself. You're keeping a rule, but you are not purified. You're keeping a rule of purity, but you're not purifying yourself. You're actually making yourself suffer, which should help to purify you. Because if you see when you suffer from the attachment of wanting to go have a drink, but I can't because I've taken this vow, or I want to go have some beer and get drunk, you see, you're suffering. Hopefully, you'll see, oh, my attachment to beer, when there's no beer around, I can't do it, it makes me suffer. I don't want to have an attachment to beer, because if I don't have it, then I'll be able to sit here without thinking about beer and be totally happy, because actually it's a beautiful day, a beautiful temple, a beautiful meditation hut. And why should I be thinking about having a beer? Why don't I enjoy this beautiful place where I am now and this beautiful tree behind me? and uh, just enjoy it right now where I am, in the here and now. Uh, you need to use your breath. You need to train. The breath is your anchor. When you train the breath is your anchor to remain in the present moment, you will then see your brain. What a monk would say, you will start watching your mind. Because your brain throws up thoughts, and in Buddhism we call that jitta, mm -hmm, mind. There are neurons firing in your brain and you get the illusion of thoughts occurring, right? Thought bubbles start popping up one after the other. Put, to, put, oh I forgot to call my mum yesterday, to, put, my dad called the day before, to. You are separate in a box, the watcher and the thinker. When you are still, your mind is still. You, what, what, your awareness has become still. Your consciousness is still and is apart from and looking at your thoughts, your mind. Then the mind disturbances, the, the eruptions, they're like volcano eruptions, thoughts. It's like lava, bubbles erupting in the lava if it's an angry thought, yeah? If they're cool, happy thoughts, and it's maybe like bubbles in the stream. But they're still bubbles, and they're still impermanent, and they still pop. Be they nice bubbles or hot, burning bubbles, it doesn't matter. All thoughts are just pop, pop, and one pops away. What I was just thinking a minute ago is gone. The bubble popped, and now a new bubble is forming. And it's going to pop and make place for the next thought to pass through my mind. And each one passes through and dies so that the next one can be born. Yeah? And there's just arising and ceasing. Arising and ceasing. Now you look at your breath and you will see it's arising, breathing in. It ceases at the end for a moment, complete cessation. And then you're breathing out, which is like the process of moving towards cessation. And when the breath at the end breathes out completely, it also stops for a split second, which is complete cessation, Nibbana. But you don't notice it. You actually go there twice every breath. You go to Nibbana twice every breath without realizing. The two times your breath stops, you go to a place where you can, where you could intuit Nibbana. You don't go to Nibbana if you've got a body, but you could it understand, see, and intuit Nibbana, what it means, what it, what it would be like to enter Nibbana before you get there. So, having ADHD, is it a condition? No. The doctors find 40 people, one like me, I have another friend who's a very clever, I would say he's, yeah, he's a genius. People say to me who know me well, I'm a genius. I don't know. That's just a word. I just know what I know. What's a genius? I don't know. But uh, if a genius is whatever you think it is, my friend with ADHD is a genius to them. For me, the concept of genius is I don't know. So I don't know if I'm a genius or not. But I have ADHD too, and so did Einstein. Now Einstein, you know, he couldn't remember his number or his address, and he actually hired mathematicians to prove 
E equals MC squared because he couldn't do the complex maths himself with ADHD. What he could do was visualize the whole thing in a four-dimensional way that no other human could visualize at that time who was working on that topic. There's probably some other human who had, a, had the same power of mind but wasn't working in maths. Actually, he was working something else, book taking or something, but anyway. Um, he hired mathematicians to make the mathematical proofs for him because he did what he called the mental experiment. He just imagined the train, the person on the train, it's moving at the speed of light, he could do the basic math. The person standing on the, uh, in the station watching the train go by. To be able to see how time moves at a different speed for the person traveling at the speed of light, or even, actually, for even just a person moving, time travels. For me walking, if somebody was sat still, and I'm talking to them while I'm walking, my time and my clock, will, my watch, will actually move at a slightly, minuscule, unmeasurable for our instruments, at a different speed. So time moves at a different speed, depending on how still or fast you're going, how slow or fast you're going. Or if you're moving at the same speed together in parallel or not. Otherwise time moves at different speeds. Which of course means time travel is possible and that's what we're doing. We're actually traveling through the time space because there is not, you think of empty space and time? No, there's just one fabric called space time. It's bending around me. If you think of, put a grid on everything. Imagine you could get this camera lens to put like a grid, a 3D grid over everything. You know, cross lines everywhere. But what make them bend around every 3D object. So imagine I'm walking through water. You could see the currents moving around me now and being influenced to flow over there. And then they hit that tree over there. And that tree is still, but it's got its own force field. And so when I go like this, I'm moving space time. When I'm speaking, my breath is sending particles. There are photons reflecting off my forehead. Yeah. That's ADHD, you know, you're seeing these things happening. ADHD is a hundred things entering your head at the same time. And you cannot prioritize which one of them is most important because they all have equal importance. And so for me to decide what I'm going to explain to you now, it's quite difficult because I can only choose one, but actually I have 108 things in my head right now, right now at this second, which I could talk about. All in the present moment. And they have nothing to do with tomorrow or yesterday. At all. Are you aware of your breath or have you forgotten? You've forgotten, haven't you? Are you aware you're breathing whilst I'm talking and breathing? Or were you just listening to what I was saying and forgot to remain aware of breathing? If you forgot, then don't say darn it, because darn it is not being aware of breathing. Recognize that, oh darn it, I forgot, as an obstacle. So as soon as you think, oh darn it, I forgot to keep on, focused on my breathing while Ajahn Spencer's talking, yeah. Just ignore that and know that actually that's just another thing, proliferation of thought, stopping me from getting back to what I'm supposed to be doing, which is being aware of my breathing while Ajahn Spencer is talking to me. And also in whatever I do after Ajahn Spencer hangs up and I do other things. I don't know where the microphone is on this. I don't want you to look up my nose. I don't want to teach people to say Buddha or a mantra. Do you know if an alien language, Bud, for Buddha or Putto, the Buddha, huh? They give you this two syllable mantra. Let's make a different two syllable mantra to be aware of, because to be aware of the breath and then be aware of a two words, two single syllable words whilst trying to focus on the breath. For me, with ADHD, chanting a mantra to help focus on the breath is actually a distraction. So I would say uh, we will use this word 
for the in-breath. Now listen, it's an alien word from another planet, right? This is the uh, mantra syllable you use when you take an in-breath, yeah? The word sounds like this, listen. Yeah? And the word, the mantra for breathing out on that planet is this. So all you have to do actually to say the mantra, we're lucky as humans on our planet we have this nose. Yeah? And when we breathe in, the, the, the feeling and sensation and sound that it makes, be it audible or not, Meaning if it's soft breath, you can't hear it. But if you do it loud, like I just did it to demonstrate, yeah, then it's audible. Yeah? Be it audible or not, yeah? <laughs> it's a word. So, you have to breathe and focus on the breath anyway. So let's make the sound and sensation of the breath the word of the mantra. And unify it into one. Doesn't have to be an English word. Buddha isn't English either. If they told you to say Eko or Jantra, which means moon, by the way, moons, you know, you still wouldn't understand what you're saying. And uh, so if <laughs> was a word and <laughs> was a word, you don't have to understand that either. And because Word is also the in-breath at the same time, you know, you, you breathe in, that's how you say the word <laughs> And you breathe out when you say the word <laughs> Yeah So I'll say it in your, you know, that's how I say it in ADHD I'll say it in simple human terms, on earth terms, yeah uh, it's really hard to say it how normal people say it. Um, you don't use a mantra, you just focus on the breath. People think, oh, I need a mantra to help me focus on the breath. Well, if you understood what I just explained, the breath is the mantra. The breath is the mantra, it's a word. Every word you say, you use breath. Huh? You say, who? Who? Watch your lungs and your throat when you say the word who or hi. <sighs> hi. You're breathing. You cannot speak without breathing. So don't tell me that the word <sighs> and the word <sighs> is not a mantra because it is. Well, I will now conclude after a long roulette of explanations with the answer to the title of this post with is ADHD an illness or is it just a condition there are thousands of people who are don't fit in with the rules of society and cannot function with the way society demands that if you want to get assistance you have to go fill in form B42 and get it from this and do it before that date and blah 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 a person with ADHD even you normal people you're stressed by it all your yearly tax returns work and God, I don't know because I'm off the grid, semi off the grid, so I don't have to do those kind of things because it would kill me. But even you guys get stressed up. I'm talking about people who have not been diagnosed with ADHD or PTSD or bipolarism or whatever they want to call it, yeah? ADHD, bipolar, autistic, Wheeler's syndrome, all of these things, yeah? 500 people have ADHD, I'll tell you what, each of those 500 people have their own personal condition and no two of them are alike, like the amulets, Pat Sumdet, no two Sumdet are alike. So how is medicine going to invent 500,000 categories, one category for each person, what type of illness is that, what type of condi mental condition is that? They can't, so they say, okay, anybody who behaves between this 
graph this between this kind of behavior and this kind of behavior, we say they have ADHD and generalize it all. And if these 5,000 individuals who are completely different and each have their own way of thinking and are completely... Everybody is their own world and their own universe. No man is an island, but we're all islands floating in a great ocean and we can see each other across the ocean. Hi there, everybody. My universe is an island. I can't get outside myself. I can't get inside you. And you are the same. But we are looking at each other across space and time. Across space-time, yeah? We are islands in the sea, looking across the ocean at each other. That's beautiful. Some poet must have said that, and it's stuck in my memory. It must have been Khalil Gibran or something. Or maybe when I was a young hippie, tripping, and reading Timothy Leary's The Psychedelic Experience. Yeah, I did all that stuff when I was a kid. So, no, we are not sick. We just refuse to are and are incapable of fitting in with a completely insane, unenlightened and deliberate, and not deliberately, but just happens by chance. That's a conspiracy theory. Just happens by chance because this is samsara, yeah? to increase people's unenlightenment and lock them in the prison of thought that is unenlightened dualistic thought of tomorrow and yesterday, good and bad, up and down, right and wrong, and all of these concepts yeah, of dualism, instead of just stopping and being still and noticing what's happening and seeing things for what they are instead of naming them, instead of naming that thing there as a tree, yeah, there's a tree. Why do I just sit and look at that strange thing for what it is? Because it's not a tree. Just look at that strange thing, man. Look at it. Don't condition it. Just look at it. It's just there, what it is. That's all it is. What it do, what, it's there, what it is. It's not a tree. It's not anything. It is what it is. How strange, huh? Isn't that strange? Isn't it? If it isn't, then you don't, you're not like me. If it's a tree, just a tree, then you're not like me. If you're a two-year-old child, if, a, if you saw you were a one-year-old child, or, and you were crawling along when you saw that, or that statue over there, or whatever, even this flower down here, with a, a, a bumblebee on it, you wouldn't know what it was at all. You wouldn't even have a name for it. You'd be fascinated. You'd be completely... Can't you remember when you were that old? Before you named things? Seeing things with the eyes of a child? Unconditioned? Have you forgotten your breath? <laughs> yes, you have. Well, keep practicing. Every time you forget, don't go, oh, damn. Just go back to being aware of the breath whilst the John Spencer is talking or whilst you're looking at that thing, whatever it is, be aware of the breath whilst you're looking at this strange green thing. Oh, well, green is also a word, but anyway. Whilst you're looking at this amazing, strange thing over here, be aware of your breath, be aware of your breath, be aware of your breath all day, all night, 24-7, 365. And the mantra is... Okay. So there's no such thing as ADHD, PTSD, uh, bipolarism, and so on. They're just basic categories, cubby holes, so that the medical industry, uh, psychologists and so, they have to f define everything. So it's just a generalization and def definition for people who do not fit in or refuse to comply with falling asleep or becoming unenlightened, or just living in a mad society outside of this big wall I have, which I never go out of if I don't have to, because out where you guys are, most of you, unless you're a monk in a temple watching me, which I think some of you might be. Um, 
you know, outside of there, it's madness to me. And it's very, I mean, it's compassion arise because, you know, it's the same madness that you suffer from yourself to greater or lesser degree. Some of us suffer it to greater degree and are completely lost in thought of the future and the past and whatever, and are not awake. And some of us have moments of sati, sampachanya, of, of um, focus and mindfulness. That's the greatest word, really, ajajja, is the mindful way. To be mindful, to be conscious, aware of what is happening. And you use the breath, the forgotten again, you see. You use the breath as the anchor. So the first thing you do when you wake up is focus on the breath. And start your day by trying to remain focused on the breath. When you go to the kitchen to get a coffee or the bathroom to brush your teeth and wash your face, you've already started watching your breath. It should be the first thing when you wake up tomorrow. Hopefully this Facebook Live might have um, kicked the butt of your subconscious enough that when you wake up, maybe the first thought in your brain when you wake up will be, Ajahn Spencer's talk on focusing the breath from waking up point. And all of a sudden you will look at your breath and forget what my conversation and don't think about it, just stay looking at the breath. And, try, and see, every time you slip and remember you've slipped, don't say darn it, because that's just delaying the return back to meditation. Skip that and just go back and don't be bothered about it. We've gone, we're going to slip a billion times till you become enlightened. But that's how you do it. That's how you start. That's how you start. Huh? I think I'm going to sit down. Because of my breath. So that's how you start, really, Baya. And that's why the breath is important, because of the subconscious process. It's a subconscious process able to access as a portal to the rest of the processes of the subconscious mind. And once you have done that by keeping mindfulness of the breath, you stay mindful of the breath, it will still the mind so that you might want to watch the thoughts of the brain as they bubble thoughts pop and go and notice they are impermanent, not self and dissatisfactory, which is the three marks of existence, exists in Sankara. The fourth aggregate, ah, well, one of the five, no, it's not the fourth, one of the five aggregates, yeah? Sankara, conditioned thoughts, and all conditioned things, meaning your body, the whole material universe is also conditioned. But in this case, it means conditioned thoughts. In, out, remember the alien mantra? And if you're aware of the breath, you can then look at your emotions or feelings, it's better said, and your thoughts. And you can look at perception, how perception brings your, the thoughts of your brain to your consciousness, how it travels, like Mercury, the winged messenger with the wings on his heels. Hmm? Mercury is the god of communication and telepathy because he can travel instantly from one place to another, which of course is the speed of thought or the speed of perception. So he's the god of perception, as is the Egyptian god Horus. But perception is one of the five aggregates which we have to study in our meditation and contemplate whilst not forgetting to remain aware of the breath simultaneously. So, whilst remaining aware of the breath, you can watch your feelings, because being aware of the breath, it will still your consciousness. It won't still your brain. The best thing is notice the brain. The brain will think. You don't follow the thoughts. You stay in the room apart as the watcher, and you watch the thinker. And you watch the monkey mind, as some people call it. I call it the thinker, the watcher and the thinker. 
Because if you call it the monkey mind, it's going to get angry and rebel, and it's actually one part of your mind. So you don't want to be start having a boxing match with yourself. Yeah? It's just a naturally programmed conscious and subconscious parts of the brain. But as an expert practitioner, you are now accessing what most people cannot access through the breath as the portal into the other processes that are subconscious or invisible. Or invisible, yeah? I think I have something in my eye. And so, your feelings are invisible, but you can watch them and notice that they rise and fall and pop like bubbles, just like thoughts. And you can learn to intuit and see the truth of impermanence, the first mark of existence. We have three marks. Now actually with breath, mindfulness, and noticing the first mark of existence within each of the five aggregates, yeah? You write Google and study if you want to know the five aggregates, because you need to understand what they are. So when you're meditating, you can look at them and contemplate. Once your consciousness is still, you are mindful of the breath. The brain is thinking away, you can leave it to do what it wants. And go look at your feelings, or look at the perception that travels to the brain and makes thoughts, or travels to the, to, carries thoughts from the brain to the heart and makes feelings follow it along the line, or that carries the mosquito bite on your finger to the brain and makes consciousness occur of the event. And then the brain makes words and thoughts and conditions the event into something imaginary like a bumblebee just stung me. But if there is no self, how can it sting you? There is no me. Yeah. But you condition, your brain will say, oh, a bumblebee, a mosquito just bit me. Hmm? But actually, it's just a feeling, you know, that something makes a hole in your finger and pulls some blood out, some blood gets pulled out of your finger and then a message is transmitted to the organ in this bone thing called the brain by humans in our language. And then a consciousness arises of the event. But a mosquito bit me? That only exists in my mind. Actually, what happened just happened. But it wasn't anything. It doesn't really have a name. Think, things, things don't really have a name. They have an atomic number. That's the true name. They have a composition. They have a structure, which is geometric and molecular, or plasmic, or even if it's metaphysical, non-physical, it still has a structure which is where sacred geometry comes in, and that's for another day, because I'm going to go in very... I'm just getting a message here. Uh, let's go. I have to go in and do something now. So anyway, ADHD is not an illness, because if ADHD is somebody who's mentally ill, well, fuck me. Albert Einstein, E equals MC squared, which has just been proved with the latest um, discoveries in quantum physics uh, through black holes and new ways we had of measuring uh, gravitational fields and other aspects of black hole behavior. Uh, Einstein's theory of relativity uh, stands up a, lo a lot of uh, E equals MC squared and so and. He was mentally ill then, he had ADHD. Einstein was mentally ill. And so one of hum the humanity of, uh, the history of civilization of hu humankind, one of our greatest figures, yeah? Who made everything possible from atomic theory to the, uh, which I know Hiroshima and stuff, but he didn't do that. Can't blame him for that to uh, time travel and space travel, which we have now, we have because of Einstein, a mentally ill person. He wasn't mentally ill, but he had ADHD and he couldn't remember his own phone number. And do you know what? Neither can I. But I can speak six languages, I can code in various languages, I can read a virus and understand what it is and actually find out who made it and 
in most cases find out who they are and where they are. Don't bother them, but I do that often. And stuff like that. So uh, I don't think I'm mentally ill. I just think I'm different and that I'm not willing to fit. And I think most people would agree with the norms of society. If you try to go to a government office and get something done, by the time you get home, you want to bash somebody on the head with a baseball bat. Are you breathing? Yeah, so um, it's madness and it is never going to be enlightened lost in all of that. So you need to be breathing and examining. And not just in a meditation hour. People make a little meditation room and then put a candle on and an alarm clock that goes bing after 45 minutes. And if you've had a good one and tried hard, when it goes bing, all of a sudden, you let the string snap and you go, OK, I've done my duty. I can now go downstairs, eat an ice cream, make a pack, make a, uh, open a bag of chips and uh, watch a movie. And you forget to watch your breath because you just did your one hour daily meditation. That's absolutely stupid because the hour of meditation and the state you attain in your mind during that hour it's not supposed to switch it off at the end of the hour and go back to being an unenlightened person and go downstairs. You can go downstairs and watch a movie. But what you're supposed to do is, if you've attained awareness of the breath and become awake to a certain level, you might not be a fully enlightened awake Buddha, but you will feel much more awake if you practice this. And you'll un you practice this yourself and you'll understand what I mean. That you are much more awake and aware of what's happening around you and within your own self. Which means if you're getting angry, you'll see it coming and you won't shout at somebody because of this practice. It will ha make you fast enough to see things coming, even your own mind, even your own emotions. Yeah? So, but anyway, I've got ADHD like Einstein. Don't listen to crazy people. Don't believe crazy people. Try it out for yourself, you know. I'm sure there were people saying the Buddha was crazy, some of the Brahmins. I wonder if they would say the Buddha had ADHD in this day and age. I wonder what they would diagnose the Buddha with, with his teaching. I'll end with that. Is ADHD a sickness or uh, uh, autism? I would say no, actually. I would say it's just a state of existence that, it, that that's how that person is. That's his natural state. Respect him for it. Or her. So that was a long talk. I am not dressed as a Rusi and sat in, in the ashram, but I felt inspired to talk, so... I hope I might have said something interesting to somebody or useful to at least somebody somewhere. And I uh, wish you all a good morning from here in Thailand. And I'm going to go inside and get some work done. Have a nice day everybody or evening depending where you are in the world. <laughs>